Thank you, and sorry for this. I had too many screens connected, obviously, and this uh, didn't work last time. It's okay, no worries. Going back to the body extensions for survival, the female terracotta figurines south of Wadi Hassa. Uh, you see that the screen now share that the yes, slide has do. changed. That's fine. Yes, when compared to the female figurines from northern and central Transjordan, the southern Edomite figurines morphology is strikingly different. Our contribution here is a small contribution also to the discussion to the low, lowland highlands debate. Um, we will see uh, how you appreciate that. There are 31 female figurines from south of Wadi Hassa. You see the different sites, nine different sites here. Uh, also on the map, it's just Rujim Hamra Iftan that is missing there because I didn't update this map. You see also Buseira has most of the figurines, three in Khalifa, two in Tabalan, and the rest is Khibad Daba also two, and the rest is only one figurine. So this does not tell us too much. Khibet Khaza at Deir and Rujim Haz at Hala. I start with them. These are two sites that are mentioned by Nelson Gluck in his publication in uh, 35. And he just mentions that he found them on the surface. I quote on the bottom, you see, several fragments of Astarte figurines were found one at Qasr al Deir and another at Rujm Has al Hala, being in too poor shape either to draw or photograph. To judge from their texture, they seem to be Iron Age one. So uh, we have no picture here, no illustrations. They are lost, I think, forever. I never could trace them. But it's here important that he started already also with this interpretation that these are uh, representations of a goddess of Astarte. Um, I go to the next, Tal Khalifa. This is all in the south here, you see it on the map. And uh, I will here show three figurines. Um, this is here the indications. Uh, one has been found recently by myself, or I could find it again in Harvard Semitic Museum. I will show a picture that you probably never saw. And then two others again are just mentioned in Nelson's Gluck, uh, third season of excavation at Tel Khalifa in uh, 1940, was found a pottery plague representing the pregnant mother goddess. You have again these keywords, the goddess of fertility. It was made with conspicuous crudeness and is startlingly ugly. Here in the point, 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 he is developing this idea that this is really ugly and he cannot understand that this is so ugly because the pottery in the region is so nice. A figurine of equal ugliness representing the same type of fertility goddess was found in another room. You see this model of this goddess model that will be uh, represented today. It is, um, it is repeated. This is the third um, figurine that is in Harvard Semitic Museum. You see it's very worn. Uh, till now there were only drawings existing from Pratico and it is in a way different than the others but also the same. You see here the arms bent towards the breasts. Here you can still see them even when the surface is very worn. She has traces of red paint all over, even when it is now um, uh, worn like this. Uh, a girdle that is uh, a special, there is no other a figurine with such a large girdle. And here it seems that here the belly is broken because you can see it from the side here, it is possible that she had a belly that was a bit protruding, that she was pregnant, but this we cannot say anymore. So I will not work too much with this figurine because it is good to have it in the database, but um, it is limited. Pratico in 93 uh, says very carefully, it is uncertain, referring to this figurine, whether this figurine should be classified with the Negevit uh, assemblage. Its fabric is quite different from the typical wares of that tradition. 
Although evidencing the characteristic crudity of this pottery, the piece exhibits an element of decorative refinement that appears out of place. I was speaking about this uh, large girdle. We have fine girdles, but never these large ones. I come to the next site, Riabat Fainan. This is now in the lowlands. Only one figurine is there attested. I mention it fast because it will also not be, it doesn't help really to interpret because it's not even sure if it's a female or a male. It has been published in 212 by Tom Levy and uh, his team. Uh, you see it here. I got the photo from Tom Levy. Uh, you see it is quite big. The head already is eight centimeters or even more. Uh, this is exceptional because all these figurines, normally they are between 12 and 16 centimeters. And here is already half of it almost is the head. And we do not know if it's female. So I let it also here for this presentation at the site, but it's good to have it in the database. Rujm Hamra Ifdan, also there has been found uh, one piece of a figurine, one fragment only. Um, you see it here. I took the scan. I made a scan from the book New Insights, Volume 2. I found it there. And um, it is also here a drawing. It seems that it has no anklets. This would be a sign, as we have it in Amon, that with these many anklets here um, uh, around the, the, the ankles. Uh, it is uh, dated to the 10th century. Um, it is good to know about it, but also it is really not diagnostic because these feet do not tell us too much. I come to Khirbet at Daba, next site that is here, the point uh, 33 on the highlands, and we'll show you the figurines there. Charlotte Whiting, she mentions three figurines, but she shows only two in her report. The first preliminary report that I mentioned here from 2.8, and there is one head and uh, there is a bust. She has another pattern to explain, two of the anthropomorphic figurines, the fragment of a small head and the bust of a figurine have been identified as pillow figurines. For parallels, see Kletter, and she uh, refers to his um, publication of the figurines from Tal Ira. This is correct. These are not the Judean pillow figurines, but I think we should be careful with all these terms, plague and pillar, because they are already taken by a certain group of figurines. And when we use them, then um, it's, it's, uh, um, it's a risk that we are uh, not really precise in describing these figurines. This is this head here from Khebet Adaba. You see, it is the, the, it's not clear if there are ears. Uh, the hair is not really indicated. It's not clear if there is a kind of a headdress, um, but this is all what I have. I got it from Charlotte and I'm happy also again to know about it, but because all these heads, they are, unfortunately, we do not know how the body looked that was below of this head. When you see now this here, this piece here, you think probably, oh, nice, I see the breasts and I see uh, here is the, the head missing, but in fact, it is upside down. And you see here, this is the good way to look at it. Um, here, this is the breasts. They are, uh, the arms are bent towards the breast. They are cupping the breasts here, these hands, and uh, the head is unfortunately broken. You see also here, probably it was a pregnant figurine because there is a part of the body is uh, broken away, but we cannot say. And so also here, this is difficult to interpret. I come to the main point here today, Rebet uh, Anahas. There is only one mold that has been found. Um, it has been published in 2.8 and then in 2.14 in the two volumes. The interpretation or some sentences given by Tom Levy uh, at the side of the photo, you will see it in a second. Mold for casting molten image, because we are in an area where there is copper melting, could represent a South Levantine goddess. Here we have again this uh, pattern, such as Astarte, Ishtar, Kubaba, Atargatis, or some other. 
Yes, this is again the same pattern. I do not want to comment it. Here we have uh, the mode on the left. Probably uh, at the first glimpse, you do not see a lot. And there is a modern cast at the side. I got this photo from Tom Levy. You see here also the impression of the nose. <laughs> this is all what you probably see when you look at that. I worked a bit on the photo. Here we have a second one. It was published like this in the in the two volumes insights uh, it is a better contrast here to see the modern cast uh, plastic cast that was taken here from this mold you see also it is bent here and the next photo shows a bit more from the inside of this mold that is a kind of thick clay uh, black clay here is the nose again the impression the ear is about uh, the eye <laughs> one eye is about here the other eye is here in this broken part the mold is broken here along this part you see also from the hair here these two strings a bit better here now uh, a photo that i worked a bit reworked a bit uh, of this uh, modern cast because this is uh, all what we have i never found the mold in uh, in jordan but uh, hopefully this will happen you see some characteristics and the main characteristic is this braid here this braid with this loop at the end that is kind of exceptional, but we have it elsewhere in Jordan, uh, but not in the south. And you will see then also that in all the Busera figurine, none has this braid that is here well uh, represented. Here could be an earring. The ear is visible also. This is also a difference to the Busera figurines. They have no ears. And here is one. Then a kind of a headdress here with some, some lines here, not so clear what it is. It seems to have a small medallion here on the forehead. And it can also be just a headband or it is really a headdress. This is all we see. No jewelry here around the neck. Uh, one ear here, the one eye is uh, broken away, but the other can be seen, it is quite, it is very big. Paral uh, parallels will come uh, immediately. Here is now also from the DVD in the Insights volumes is, uh, I found this uh, view from the side now from this plastic cast you see the big nose but other things are quite it is a low resolution photo I couldn't find something better but you see at least the big nose here are now parallels and parallels in a certain way of these uh, braids or pigtails here with this uh, with this loop the direction is different you see this uh, the same or uh, similar uh, braids we have here in Tel Rehov, a figurine from the 9th century, and also another figurine has this same uh, braids with this loop, but it's always turned outside and not inside as it is here. So this is a particularity that is only in Chebet Anahas and not in these other figurines. This one cannot be dated, but here we have a clear date. Ami Mazar was digging in uh, Tel Rehov and he defined here the, the, the dating of this figurine. Another, there are two more. Uh, there are more, but I show you just a few now here from Talderalla. It is a mold that is found here. It was found by Franken in 61. He dated it to iron one. And you see again, this kind of uh, braids with this loop that goes outside, not inside like here. And the same here, this is a figurine from in the region of Karak. It was in a private collection. It was Harding who, uh, like Sir Harding, who uh, published it in 37. And then he told us that this figurine uh, is uh, in a collection of uh, official of the Arab Legion. So I never saw it, unfortunately, because a nice one. Uh, it seems also to be the same type with this braid that is, in fact, a type that is um, from the 10th, from the 11th, uh, from the 9th century, uh, as we have certain examples. Here is a figurine, uh, another type, but you have the same loop here. Uh, the head is unfortunately gone. Um, and you see this loop here, the remains of this loop of this, uh, of this braid, probably from Tal Al-Fara North on the highlands in the west, 
from the 10th century here. This is the definition of the excavator and uh, a figurine that is probably made from the same mold or from the same workshop or a same series of molds here with the zigzag on the belly. Here also, this is Terrehof, 10th century. And we have again, this small loop here of this, of this, um, of this headdress that is very specific. Small resume uh, to say we have on Chebeda Nachas, a uh, kind of a headdress with this braid. It's only one that is visible because the other is broken that appears on several figurines in the north. This means in the Southern Levant, but this goes to that, this goes till Amman. I have one figurine that I couldn't show here. I just mentioned it uh, here on the bottom of this um, of this slide uh, because I will publish it with Yazid El Ayan. It's from um, Amman uh, Citadel, where we also have this uh, loop and this braid, and we will see uh, how he is dating uh, this figurine. So a particularity that goes well with the dating that uh, Tom Levy and his team has in uh, Chebet and Nachas, but that confirms also other figurines in the whole region, in fact. I move now over to my colleague who will, uh, who will continue on Buseira and Tabilan and uh, tell you his thoughts about these figurines. And Andre, I'm sorry, you have Five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me. I will look uh, much more on the Highland Osaira figurines. That we, uh, there is only seven figurines in the one in um, that I will uh, try also to approach much more from a theoretical um, framework in this, in this presentation. And my main questions are, do figurines invite the beholder into a private miniature world or are the figurines constantly refer to the real social world, allowing values and norms of the community to enter in private minds or spaces? Or do figurines have a constitutive role in a self-organizing social political complexity? These are my, my questions that I wanted to ask that are really uh, hard to find and for that, I uh, choose or I work with a framework developed by Lambros Malafuris from Cognitive and, uh, Archaeology from Oxford. And uh, he has, uh, he uses, so he synthesizes some principles from cognitive science and anthropology in, the, um, in a working framework. He has the principle of extended mind, that things are co-substantial, continuous between the mind and the material. And uh, the inactive sign that it's things are material signs that's being fro fro being forth rather than that are simply represent uh, something, you know, represent, uh, to criticize the Cartesian philosophy. And the material agency that things have a causal effic efficacy in the human thought and action. Uh, the material, I will start with the material agency that uh, I, I will you I am applying to the figurines. I will, I will rather demonstrate the agency of mat material agency through the figurines. But now I will describe only the, the theoretical part or how the, how the no notion of material agency proposed by Knappet and Malafuris helps to conceptualize the role of figurines in human, human cognitive life that they have um, a scaffolding role in the in the, in the re, in the relation with hu humans by looking at the effects of figurines on the sets of social relations attached to various forms of sensory activity associated to, with their use. Here we have a, a fluidity of of their use by by touching, by seeing, by by keep like uh, keeping an amulet. We have different uh, modality of using the figurines and also. Uh, different scale of sizes that we, we, we perceive on the figurines. By examining figurines as agents of tradition and change through the social relation, they help create and maintain or renegotiate in that they have also an effective um, scaffolding that um, they enter in a relation, emotional relation with, with humans. 
and by looking at different forms and networks of production, exchange, and use. Also here, I think it's important that means of production of the figurines, it's important on how, um, how they signify um, the clay, the color, the, the touching, each one it has a rich, um, rich affordance or possibility in the, in the meaning of a figurine or by exploring the social consequences in different historical contexts. I move very quickly. Body extensions. What I mean by body extensions, uh, I draw from philosophy phenomenology of Shaw Gallagher, but he's also using the phenomenology of Monoponti that makes a difference between body schema and uh, body image or body, lived body and physical body. By very schema, we, we understand or Ponti understood how we move in the, in the environment, how we make sense of the environment, and how we perceive affordances for action in our environment. And figurines, by applying that to figurines, we can conceptualize them as, as tools that drive us or that conduct us to some specific act that by seeing that, we can see that uh, we have a know-how. Figurine can depict a know-how in, in a society in the same, the same time as uh, something about them or what they represent. The representation and the action mode, they are, they are synchronous. Andre, sorry, you have two minutes, please. Okay, okay. Uh, then, uh, but how we can exactly pinpoint um, a meaning? I was I was thinking that conceptualized by triangulation of use, function, and purpose. In fact, by 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 asking what, how they are used, uh, when they are used, and why they are used, we can um, see the performance, the performative aspect of the figurines. That because we see them in action, people use them in a performative way, either by by putting in, in a tomb, in a ritual. They have uh, meaning by by using them. And also, I was thinking how there is by the figurines contribute in a sense, in a way, or the material agency in conceptualizing the social complexity. And I think by by giving uh, to the materials in the material cultures much more agency, we can conceptualize. Also, we can have a model of self-organizing that could 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 work more with much more. Um, how can I uh, central control uh, institutions by a distribution of authority by giving much more uh, agency to materiality. Um, and here I, I had also one, and I think I can say thank you very much for, for receiving me.